Good evening, everyone. My name is Jenny Cole, and I'm the Director of Collections Access at the Filson Historical Society. I'm so glad you all are able to join us this evening. The Filson would like to thank the Thomas W. Bullitt Perpetual, Perpetual Charitable Trust for sponsoring this evening's lecture. I'm very happy to introduce tonight's speakers, Dr. Daniel Gifford and Dr. Patrick Lewis. Dan Gifford is a public historian who focuses on American popular and visual culture, as well as museums in American culture. His career spans both academia and public history, including several years with the Smithsonian Institution. He received his PhD from George Mason University in 2011, and now teaches courses on American history and museum studies at the University of Louisville and Spalding University. Dr. Patrick Lewis is the Filson's Director of Collections and Research. A Trigg County, Kentucky native, he graduated from Transylvania University and holds a PhD in history from the University of Kentucky. It's so great to have you two here tonight to discuss this incredibly interesting topic. I'm going to turn the program over to Dan now, and I will be rejoining after the presentation to moderate questions that come in through the chat. So thank you all again, and I'm handing it over to Dan. All right, thank you so much, and thank you everyone who's uh, joined. Um, I really appreciate uh, the turnout for tonight's uh, lecture. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do a, a switch over to some slides. So um, this program kind of started with a conversation. It was a conversation between uh, Patrick Lewis there at the, the Philson and myself about uh, my new book, uh, The Last Voyage of the Whaling Bark Progress. And you know, if, if you've attended Philson lectures before, you may, you know, wonder if you've stumbled into the wrong topic because for an organization that deals with Kentucky history and the history of the Ohio River Valley, probably whaling is the last topic that you thought you might hear about at, at the Philson. But um, as Patrick and I talked about this book, um, it quickly became apparent that we were uh, interested in a lot of the same things that sort of expanded well beyond the fact that that one of the centerpieces of this story is a whale ship. And I'll start with this cover image itself. Here's a, a little bit of a blown up of that. And the city that you see behind it is not New Bedford or even Boston or New York or some um, East Coast city. This is Chicago. Um, and you have a whale ship that has come to Chicago and specifically to the Chicago World's Fair, some are often called the World's Columbian Exposition was its formal name. Um, and in that you have this sort of meeting of worlds, you have whaling sort of coming to the Midwest and uh, that was, you know, something that I think uh, was of, of interest, but even more than that, the reason it was was here uh, in the Midwest, here in Chicago, in Chicago um, was to be displayed as a museum. It was actually meant to be a floating museum. And you can see uh, the words on this brochure. This was actually a stint that it had prior to uh, the Columbian Exposition um, in downtown Chicago. Uh, and you see it advertised as a complete marine and whaling museum. And so that really opened up um, this dialogue about museums and what museums were like at the beginning, at kind of the, the cusp of the 20th century. Um, and this particular museum is really kind of fascinating as a case study. And I'll show you two pictures that, that sort of explain why. Um, this is the whaling ship as it left New Bedford. You see, you know, very much a carnival uh, celebratory atmosphere. There were estimated 3,000 people that came out to see the whaling ship progress depart on its way to Chicago, on its way to the World's Fair. And that happened in, 18, in June of 1892. This is what it looked like by 1900. Um, it's, it's falling apart, it's decaying um, at the mouth of the Calumet River um, as it sort of uh, enters Lake Michigan, surrounded by pollution, surrounded by you know, industrial muck. Um, and eventually, about two more years after this, it eventually succumbs to fire and dynamite and, and sinks to uh, basically a watery grave. So, you know, not only am I looking at a museum, but I'm looking at, you know, what obviously is a, is a spectacular failure. You know, something went horribly wrong 
here. And, and that's what really sort of opened the door to this conversation about museum craft and what, what modern museums were and weren't. Um, and, you know, I sort of use these two images and these two stories to open my book uh, to sort of set up this question, almost, you know, maybe even call it a little bit of a mystery. You know, what went so terribly wrong for this museum dedicated to, to whaling um, in the 1890s? And, and what can that tell us about museum craft even today, museums like, like the Filson? Um, this is a, a picture of the, of the whale ship at, uh, at the Columbian Exposition. You can see uh, it in kind of all of its glory. Um, but it was also very much a teeny tiny part of this, this fair. And we'll, I'm, I'm sure, talk a lot about the fair uh, tonight. You can see this map that shows just how vast the Columbian Exposition was, the, the famous White City. Um, if you've read uh, Devil in the White City, you're familiar with this. And the arrow here in the bottom left corner shows you just this teeny tiny part. Uh, it was actually called, uh, te technically it was called the South Pond. Uh, what everyone actually called it was the Frog Pond, um, this whaling ship in, in this uh, sort of tucked away corner of, of the White City. Um, and, you know, the Columbian Exposition is, is very much this moment where America is wrestling with questions of modernity. You know, as I said, the 20th century is, is rapidly approaching. Um, and so you have uh, you know, all these hallmarks of, of the modern era, electricity, for example, um, and, you know, ways to make cities work, ways to make cities beautiful. Um, and within that, you also have people that are sort of taking on the question of museums, the question of display, the questions of exhibition. Um, they're starting to professionalize. They're starting to say that museums are not just you know, what people throw together that they happen to like, they're what people that have studied uh, the topic uh, say people should, should enjoy, say what people should experience and how um, museums and, and the world should be organized. You know, if, it, if the World's Fair was anything, it was organization writ large. And so that very, is very much part of, um, you know, this conversation about museums um, at this time. Um, so here again, just to return back to our, our whale ship, you know, and the reminder that, that this was a museum, but, but it was an odd museum. It was a museum dedicated to whaling um, on the one hand, and yet you read this banner and what they seem to be advertising is 10,000 marine curiosities. Um, and so there's a real disconnect. And this is something that, you know, is kind of at the heart of my book um, answering that question of what went so terribly wrong is, is the progress sort of sits in this moment of tension between the old and the new, between the amateur and the professional, between uh, the past and the future. Um, and, you know, I try to use my book uh, to, to tease that out. And I think, you know, all of us that work in museums or study museums deal with those questions, tackle those questions on a daily basis. And I think that you know, as Patrick and I talked more and more about uh, what I had written, we realized how many uh, sort of points there were between uh, between uh, this book, even as it was about whaling uh, or whale ship, um, and and what the the Filson does on a daily basis. Um, and then finally, there's one other aspect of this I just wanted to share. Um, this book actually originated from my own family history. In fact, uh, an obituary I discovered. Uh, doing some genealogical research of my great great grandfather, who happened to be the whaling captain who brought the whale ship from New Bedford to Chicago. Uh, he was Captain Daniel Gifford. Uh, obviously, you re recognize the name. We have the same same name. Uh, his nickname um, was Bloody Dan. He was known throughout the fleet as Bloody Dan Gifford, uh, rather colorfully. Um, but it's in his family, in my family story, that I come into this larger project, this larger piece of, of American history. Um, and that's unusual. Um, I think a lot of professional historians and, and public historians, you know, are sort of pushed away from doing such a deeply personal, deeply familial 
topic. Um, and certainly, you know, there are good reasons for that, you know, questions of objectivity. Um, but I have to say, while I was writing this book, the Filson actually uh, had an exhibit called Connecting the Dots, Exploring Your Family History. And, and, you know, I took a lot of inspiration from this particular exhibit back in uh, 2018, I believe it was, um, that, you know, telling family stories uh, is important. And just because, you know, I do this professionally and, and this book, you know, is for, you know, at, meant to be a, a taken, you know, at a professional level, didn't preclude me from, from still diving into a story that, that had roots in my own family. And I think in many ways, um, that family connection made me more empathetic to what I was seeing and what I, what I was researching and what I was uh, discovering. Um, and so I just wanted to give a little bit of a shout out and a little bit of thanks to, uh, to the Filson for, for this and for keeping, uh, keeping my momentum um, going. So that's just a little bit of background. I wanted to, to sort of explain how this program sort of came about and how Patrick and I, um, you know, started the conversation and then quickly realized that this was a conversation that we wanted to, to make public, to make a public program and to continue uh, with, with, with y'all and, and actually open it up uh, towards the end to, to your question. So I think with that, I'll stop talking, and if Patrick uh, uh, wants to join, we'll uh, we'll begin that uh, that dialogue about these topics. Well, thanks so so much, Dan. Um, there I go, um, and and yeah, and and really, I just wanted to pass along my compliments um, on the book. Um, as you said, rooting these these important themes in a family story is is very compelling, and for me to do it inside uh, this really fascinating case study. Um, of this ship, it really just sort of brought up to me so many lessons that I've um, learned the hard way or observed um, <laughs> sort of friends and peer institutions um, learning the hard way in, in working in and around museums during my career. So I, I think it just really raises these questions in such an engaging way. Um, I'd really recommend anybody who's, who wants to understand sort of the mechanics of, of how we present the past and the challenges inherent in that um, to give this a read because it's, it's very evocative. And then as Dan said, you know, I was always, I was really very interested in this because of the Filson's connection uh, to this event in Chicago, to this Columbian exposition. Of course, our own Reuben Durrett leads Kentucky's delegation up to the fair, um, dragging along with him, you know, artifacts out of his own collection and those of other Filson founders and other history minded folks um, in Kentucky at the time to sort of narrate this, um, the, this, this heroic conquering of the first American West, which was very much the, uh, the, the focus of the, uh, the early Filson's interpretive efforts. Um, of course, uh, bringing up um, Enid Yandel's <clears throat> statue of Daniel Boone, which now uh, sits out in Cherokee Park. And then thinking about these fairs as, as moments of, of huge civic transformation. And as you said, Dan, as these celebrations of modernity at the uh, the end of the 19th century um, thinking about our own in Louisville our southern exposition which was a decade before uh, the one in Chicago but the, the transformations that that wrought in this city and including of course um, sort of leading to the development of the neighborhood that is now old Louisville and the Filson's home I mean, we live very much in uh, the the wake of one of these grand moments where, where, where Louisville and then later Chicago and the entire United States really sort of advertised its, its new coming out, its emergence from the era of, of the Civil War. Um, and that's kind of where I wanted to start with you a little bit in, in thinking about modernity. Uh, the, the, the whaling is a dying industry at this time why do New Bedforders think that it's important that people understand this and send this to the fair? Yeah, and I think that's a really good point to maybe establish up front is, you know, by the 1890s, whaling really is a dying industry. Um, it's really kind of in its death throes. It's, it's sort of golden age, you know, have been, you know, in the 1840s and 1850s. Um, and you know, as to why we have this instinct, I think it's, I think it's a very human instinct as, um, you know, I look at even kind of 
modern industries like coal and steel or manufacturing, um, you know, maybe, you know, we can argue if they're dying or not, but certainly they're in transformation. And when you see that transformation taking place, you want to, as a community, sort of memorialize that somehow. You want to capture that somehow. You want to preserve it. Um, and, you know, so I think New Bedford has, has that instinct and has that, uh, that desire. Um, but, you know, there's a double-edged sword in that. And I think, you know, I, I start my book, I actually start uh, much earlier than the ship leaving, you know, once I sort of set up these, this dichotomy, um, I actually start, you know, getting to this by going back to the 1850s, by actually going back to when um, New Bedford adopted the model or the motto, uh, we light the world, the idea of whale products, um, providing light and generating light, uh, powering lighthouses, whale oil, uh, you know, generating the light that ships sail by. Um, you know, and I think particularly in New Bedford's case, it was very easy to sort of take the importance of this industry, importance of this homegrown industry, and sort of keep elevating it almost to a religious level, almost to um, a sort of metaphysical level of importance. That once it's dying, once it's disappearing, you know, leaves leaves you maybe a little bit uh, blindsided. Maybe leaves you with a blinders about the importance of the industry or how important it's going to be outside of your community. Um, and so I think that's something that you know I think a lot of curators, a lot of museums struggle with, um, is this question of you know, on the one hand, we agree with this idea of memorialization, of commemoration, of wanting to capture, you know, this piece of the past before it's gone, before it's forgotten. You know, that's kind of our job, is to make sure that these things aren't forgotten. Um, but I think in New Bedford's case, you know, one of the building blocks of this question, why did the, the museum fail, rests in the idea that um, they didn't really ever question how to present this outside of, of a community that, that knew it so well. You know, how do you present it to a community, to the rest of the world, the rest of the nation, in a way that they'll care about and and want to understand? Um, and you know, I think I don't know how many in our audience are museum professionals, but I suspect there's a few heads nodding um, at that uh, that sort of tension that that exists even even today. Absolutely. Well, and and you you put it into this. Uh, you you take. Uh, the 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 marketing uh, of that out of your hands in a lot of ways when you ship it halfway across a continent, um, and I was fascinated um, to read about all of the expectations that that people came uh, to progress with when they came to the fair, which were built out of the popular press, uh, probably not out of Moby Dick like we would assume, but out of these adventure magazines, out of even Treasure Island about what seafaring was and what it meant. Um, and, and of course, then the, the sort of advertisers in this golden, this first golden age of American um, advertising and yellow journalism uh, really take with these myths and run with them. And, and so whatever narrative left with the ship in New Bedford is kind of taken out of their hands by the time it gets to Chicago. It really does. It's, it's this fascinating case study as to what happens when you, you physically sail away from the community that you're representing. Um, you know, uh, Chicago is, is nowhere close to New Bedford. And in that journey, in that physical journey between the two, um, you sort of see the metamorphosis, you sort of see the transformation uh, taking place. And, and, you know, New Bedford assumed, I think, a very sort of educational nuts and bolts. This is, you know, this is how, you know, whaling works. This is what the tools, this is what process is. Um, and of course, by the end, by the time it makes it to Chicago, you, you might remember that banner um, from uh, the picture. You know, it's it's really about you know marine curiosities, ten thousand marine curiosities. You know, that's that's a big difference. And I think, um, as you say, you know, part of that difference really is in just the the physical physical distance between the two, um, but as as well uh, the psychological distance. Um, you know. To sort of explain this just a little bit more, um, New Bedford actually sold the progress to a Chicago uh, uh, investor. It was a syndicate, but really one one guy sort of sort of ran it. So again, you have this sort of 
question of, you know, can you sort of sell off your heritage and is it still your heritage when you do that? Um, once it's in someone else's hands, um, you know, what does it become? And, and as you know, I think you can probably guess from our, our descriptions here, it becomes something very different. Uh, it becomes very rooted and exactly as you're saying, uh, sort of popular culture tropes, you know, the idea of the, of the mariner, you know, pirates, even though pirates have nothing to do with whaling. Um, and there's a lot of stagecraft um, that goes into this, it's sort of creating a, a sort of, you know, maritime fantasy that, that really doesn't connect to whaling anymore, but sort of fits that, comfortably fits that expectation of, of the visitor of what, you know, well, it's a ship, you know, surely, you know, people say, you know, uh, Party, you know, and and yo ho ho. Um, so, um, you know, that sort of uh, question of you know how much how much do you play into an audience's expectations uh, versus how much do you educate them? And and you know, and in this case, very much it's it's who's doing who gets to answer that question. And and as New Bedford discovered, when when you sort of sell off the the goods when you sort of sell off the legacy you don't get to answer that anymore yeah well and and i thought this was really fascinating of course this isn't just a story that is is happening on the progress it's happening all over the fairgrounds right it's happening as as groups from all over the world have been imported oftentimes by by american promoters uh, and mm -hmm. businessmen who want to exoticize um, these these foreign cultures and put them on display for for people to walk by and see, um, and 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 then these same uh, you know and it's it's Native American groups it's it's groups from uh, from Africa and from Asia really from everywhere lose control of that representation of themselves. Mm -hmm. And it happens you know all as you say it happens all throughout the fair um, you know on, on multiple levels and in almost kind of insidious ways you know uh, even uh, the food that's served. Um, you know, claims to be, you know, from these different ethnicities, but, you know, it's very Americanized, you know, something that we were, if you've uh, gotten into food history at all, you recognize as, as a common theme. Um, you know, what's in the really interesting about that sort of um, backwater corner that the progress was in is it shared that sort of South Pond, that sort of with uh, a lot of Native American displays. Um, there were totem poles um, that were put there by the anthropology department. Um, so, you know, again, this sort of, you know, catch all, um, you know, idea of, of, on the one hand, wanting to organize every, organize the world in a very sort of hierarchical way. And yet, you know, other things just being sort of thrown together, um, you know, very much is at play here. Well, and I think this is really important time to, to recognize, again, the Filson's small role in this as, as Durrett comes up. Um, and bringing his, his, you know, train cars worth of, of artifacts of, of Daniel Boone and early pioneers, very much crafting his own narrative of what Kentucky is. And now we can, we can look at that now and recognize the ways in which that's an exclusionary narrative, right? And that's a one-sided narrative. That's, a, that's an Anglo-American narrative um, that can be, can be expounded by um, sort of the victors as they, as they sit in, in uh, their, their Louisville mansions and then take that up to the Kentucky building. Um, and that's a very different power dynamic than for uh, the and for all of these other groups who are there, sort of on display with with that interpretive control out of their hand. Yeah, and um, you know, this was actually this example actually didn't happen at the fair that I ever found. This was actually uh, when the ship was on display at um, um, in downtown Chicago, actually at the the end of the the State Street Bridge. Um, but, you know, sort of at its most uh, glamorized uh, maritime fantasy, they actually took one of the whale crew, one of the whalemen um, who happened to be a South Islander, happened to uh, ha be uh, heavily tattooed because of his South Island heritage, uh, and basically turned him into uh, an actor. Um, and the role that he was playing was as the Fiji king, the king of Fiji, the first uh, king, uh, first royal of Fiji who had ever come to Chicago. Uh, and of course he wasn't, he was, you know, uh, a crewman on a, on a whale ship, 
Uh, but again, that idea of uh, matching the narrative, matching um, these sort of uh, fantasies, whether they're uh, frontier fantasies of Kentucky or maritime fantasies from from you know dime novels, uh, sort of fitting fitting into that and and not doing too much to disrupt it, not doing too much to challenge uh, the viewer and the audience um, and the visitor. I really want to jump back to, again, this idea of, of interpretive clarity, uh, but to get back to these mar marine curiosities, right? Because it seems like the, the progress is trying to do two things at once, um, as so happens with, with lots of museums, especially small and local museums who find themselves, um, you know, uh, uh, caretakers of a collection that doesn't exactly fit what they want to do and ends up um, becoming a big distraction. So could you describe how those, how all of those marine curiosities, what are they and how do they, they sort of steer the interpretation away from what uh, everyone in New Bedford intended? Well, and it's interesting because, you know, a lot of the objects were collected in New Bedford. So, you know, at some point, you know, people had to say, you know, well, you know, what exactly is going to happen when it makes it to Chicago? So there's a little culpability in that, but you know, they essentially collect um, not just the whaling implements, things like harpoons and, and whale boats and lances and things like that, but seashells, um, things that have been collected from around the world. So statues and grass skirts, uh, things that were donated uh, from Arctic expeditions, uh, not just whaling, but, you know, a polar uh, exploratory expedition. Um, I saw multiple references to a sextant that has had supposedly been on the Mayflower. Um, you know, the list of there is, you know, uh, taxidermy giant turtles. There was a mummified boy from Australia. Um, you know, I, and I think you start to get a sense of just how much of a hodgepodge um, this was. Um, and it's funny because in my research, um, I, I stumbled into, uh, I was looking at, you know, the idea of displaying Whale, whale bones and whale jaws. Um, and I had stumbled into, uh, you know, a precursor even to Barnum's Museum in New York City um, back in the 1830s, Scudders. And, um, you know, this sort of hodgepodge, this sort of everything thrown together was very much um, something that, that was an early version of, of museum craft, an early version of what Barnum sort of excelled at. Um, and so what I find so fascinating about the progress um, is that, you know, it's almost a throwback um, to this older type of museum. So, you know, here at the fair where they're trying to, you know, bring in some professionalism, bring in categories and ca characterizations and, and order and hierarchy, um, to, to exhibitry and museum display. Um, here you have this whale ship that's sort of this old, you know, throwback to, you know, a, a little bit of everything, uh, you know, all thrown, thrown together. Um, what's so interesting to me about the story is this little piece of it that we're talking about actually has a Louisville connection. Um, you mentioned the Southern Expo. Um, and there was a whaling display um, at the, the exposition here in Louisville. It was the Smithsonian that put it on, or what the, it was then at the time called the National Museum. And they had actually done a really thorough, didactic, educational exhibit of whaling instruments and how they were used and you know exactly what I think New Bedford kind of hoped for. Um, but by the Columbian Exposition, their focus has turned, you know, they want to work on other things, they want to work on these new anthropology uh, displays, and so they sort of drop whaling as a priority, and, and of course you, you see what, what gets filled, you know, how that vacuum gets filled, um, and it's very different than that sort of, you know, very educational, very highly organized, very, you know, detailed labeling, um, that, that you might expect from the Smithsonian, even its early days into, you know, this, this much more eclectic bordering on, uh, you know, indecipherable uh, collection of, of marine, literally marine curiosities. 
No, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up that, that moment of professionalization in, in museum field, because I feel like this Columbian Exposition is a big moment for professionalization sort of across um, sort of a number of history disciplines. Um, you know, we have at the same time, you have Ruben Durrett and, and Teddy Roosevelt going out there and sort of putting together their, their displays of this imagined American frontier. You have at the meeting of the American Historical Association, Frederick Jackson Turner delivering his frontier thesis lecture, marking this moment where uh, a sort of a professoriate, a, a PhD holding professoriate sort of sets itself apart um, in, in doing sort of scientific, analytical, social science history um, from, from what they perceive as being this more sort of amateur um, collector, gentleman historian model um, that had come before. And then and very clearly the Smithsonian has taken that same professionalizing energy and put that into a lot of this anthropological work, which will then transition into their museums of natural history, et cetera, that are still on the mall. You can go see those collections. Um, right. Um, and, and then we start to see this, this fracturing of all of these, um, these activities that had been sort of bound up in single individuals or single organizations in the decades before this start to create degree programs, create um, you know, colleges and, and courses of study, and then start to drift apart from one another. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one of the things that's, that's interesting about, you know, this particular collection is even after the fair is over, it, it has a little bit of a, of a life, a zombie life afterwards. This is ship itself, you know, you saw that picture, uh, but all these marine curiosities um, do have value it, for some museums if they're displayed properly, if they're interpreted properly, if they aren't just all thrown together. Um, and so what happens um, is a lot of the, uh, the natural objects ended up at the Field Museum uh, in Chicago. So, um, you know, a lot of the basis of their early collections came, came from this. But the Field absolutely rebelled at the idea of having to take on the whaling implement. Um, and, and so those had to find a, another home that was appropriate for it, you know, so again, this idea of a house for everything and everything in its house, um, you know, and, and, and keeping those uh, separate and not just lumping them all together. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting in this is you sort of have this question of the professional versus the amateur, the, the collector versus the curator. Um, the sort of third layer that comes that I discovered um, that I really wasn't expecting was the influence of, of theater um, and theater spectacle in all of this. Um, my particular uh, investor that had bought the progress also was heavily involved in a theatrical production that also happened to be maritime oriented. It was a retelling of Columbus uh, sailing across the ocean. Um, and so, you know, this sort of I think today we would call it edutainment, you know, the, the, the sort of balance between being entertained versus being educated. Um, and, and that's something that you actually start to see, um, I think, at the fair as well, is, is they're, they're embracing things like, like light, like, uh, you know, new, new abilities to make colors uh, and, um, you know, modern ways, modern materials that really help stagecraft, that really help um, exhibits. And it's not, you know, just, you know, on a uh, stage in a theater, but, you know, museums pick up a lot of these cues, department stores have picked up a lot of these cues. Um, but then it, it comes back to this tension of, you know, well, are you entertaining? Are you educating? Are you using these in quote the right way? Um, and, and how does that get decided? Um, so, you know, again, a very, a very rich sort of uh, series of questions that come out of uh, out of this moment. I was I wanted to to come back to a couple of those images that you had, and we don't need to put them on the screen. But um, the the really colorful image, the bright image of the 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 fair as idealized um, as on the on the brightest possible day um, there on the on the shores of Lake Michigan, where water is clean and clear. Um, and, and these lagoons are in, in this landscape designed by, by Olmsted to be this sort of idealized space in these gloriously whitewashed buildings. And this contrast 
so greatly with um, with that that other image that you have of of the progress listing in the mud there. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, sort of the the, the end um, of the ship there and what sort of ugly realities that reveals to us about when the when the the exhibition is over. So you know one of the things that I think is you look at that that picture that colorful picture and just see the size and the the scope of the, of the fair. Um, to realize that almost all of it was meant to be temporary. Um, there is a, there's really only one permanent building um, in there. Um, and the only reason it was permanent was that's where the art uh, was displayed and the insurance companies wouldn't let the art come to Chicago if it weren't in a fireproof building. So everything else is, is a mirage. Um, it's, it's meant to be temporary. It's meant to... Uh, fall apart, and, and it certainly does. Um, fire, there's two big fires at, after the fair is over that sort of clear the landscape, cleanse the landscape, and which, you know, the fact that here you have this whale ship that is so much oil and two major fires happen all around it and it doesn't go up in flames itself is, is rather remarkable. Um, but it doesn't, it sort of lumbers on and sort of, you know, it sits in this, this frog pond, um, eventually has to get towed out of it. Um, but it's this, it's, it's really becomes this metaphor of what do you do with this, this hulking piece of the past, you know, um, that's, that's not even worth anything anymore. It's falling apart. Um, it's a literally decaying um, sort of year by year and becoming you know, increasingly dangerous, and I think more, more argued uh, is impeding um, progress. You know, it's it's in the ironically given the name progress. You know, it's in the way of shipping channels. It's in the way of of good land. You know, it's in the way of of, of modernity. Um, and so, um, you know, they, it takes a really long time for, for it to sort of finally disappear and has this sort of zombie existence that that is sort of serves as a constant reminder for the folks back in New Bedford um, about you know this this misfire this this mistake um, this sort of disaster of of display um, that you know I think really hits home and by the time it finally you know has its last moments of fire and dynamite. You know, within just a few months, the folks of New Bedford have gathered um, to start their own whaling museum, but this time in their own community, in the town of New Bedford itself. And I think um, there's a sort of, you know, a uh, little bit of amnesia to the historical record. No one actually mentions the progress at these meetings. No one really wants to talk about it. Um, but, you know, certainly the lessons learned um, are taken to heart. And I think the lessons learned by communities you know, throughout America, as they, they work to interpret, you know, local stories and, and homegrown stories, you know, kind of the same way. Well, I think that's a fantastic place for us to, to close the you and me portion of this. Um, so I would love to, to invite Jenny to come back on and, and get some questions. I know I've seen the chat box flashing down out of the corner of my screen. Yeah, we have several questions um, for um, several of them are specifically for Dan about his book and some of the work with that. Um, but then there are others that are a little more um, locally local focused too. So I'm going to start with the first one. Um, and, and you sort of talked about this, Dan, but if you would just sort of specifically answer the question, um, did the ship museum close right after the exposition or did it stay open? And you had mentioned that it was sort of banked at the end of the State Street Bridge. Could you just talk a, maybe just one more one more clarification on that? Sure, so so the, actually the State Street Bridge was before the fair. Oh, okay. never mind. So, so that, that actually was pre, pre-fair. Um, and, and I won't give away too many spoilers, uh, but bad things happen. <laughs> um, and then it finally makes it to the fair. And bottom line, it's a, it's a huge financial disaster. It absolutely cost the the investors cost this this particular Chicago uh, coal baron actually was his he was actually a, a coal um, merchant um, cost him everything 
that he had put into it. It was just a huge financial disaster. So he pretty much walks away. Uh, pretty much, he he manages to to get the the objects sold to the the Field Museum. As I mentioned, so, you know, drawing a little bit of ire uh, from them. Uh, but the ship is is pretty much abandoned, and so it, it takes um, you know many years and many attempts of, of people trying to figure out what to do with it because he essentially, you know, had lost all of his money and, and just walked away from it uh, to leave it behind. You know, and again, I think, I think we can appreciate, um, you know, that happening in communities up and down the Ohio River Valley, you know, that, you know, these pieces of heritage, you know, cause bankruptcy, cause money to be lost um, and people aren't interested in, in working with them anymore and sort of, you know, have that instinct of walking away and then, you know, what do you do with that? So I think, you know, even though this is a story from the 1890s, I think there's a, a lot of universality uh, to, to some of uh, some of what happened to the show. That segues actually really nicely into another question and I'm going out of order now, but I promise I'll, I'll get everybody's. Um, that the Louisville Science Center, part of its collection was originally the city's natural history museum. Um, and it was in the basement of the Louisville Free Public Library. And so um, one of our, our guests tonight mentions that it doesn't seem like there's the same sort of interest, at least in Louisville, to promote the natural history of the region. So I know, you know, from my millions of visits to the Science Center with my children that there's sort of a corner that, that has some natural history and some artifacts in it, but it's certainly not the focus the way, say, the Cincinnati Museum Center has a whole natural history wing. And um, of course, you know, we could mention plenty of other nationally known museums, but I'm not sure, Dan, if you or Patrick have any background or information on the, the transitioning of the Louisville, Louisville's museums into the Science Center. Um, or if you have any information on that or not. It's not something I, I know a ton about, um, you know, but, you know, I, I do think, you know, this question, uh, the way I phrased it before is uh, a home for everything and everything in its home. Um, and, you know, it does create this sort of question of, you know, is there a place for everything, you know, is, you know, is there a house for, for each, you know, field and each topic? Um, and, and how do we find that? You know, I, I know the Philson does a great collaborative work with uh, peer institutions uh, to say, you know, this isn't great for us, but I think it'd be great for, for you, you know, and that, that sort of, um, you know, collaborative effort of, of looking at, at museums as a network, not just, you know, sort of atomized individual institutions. Patrick, do you have... No, Jenny, go on. Sorry. Please. I was just then thinking about the, the Science Center specifically. They had a huge um, mineral and fossil collection, and I know some of it went to a department at Bellarm here at Bellarmine University here in Louisville, where it's a teaching collection now, and it's cataloged. And you know, if I needed to borrow a certain kind of muscle for an exhibit, and I have, <laughs> I could go there and say, "Hey, you know, Dr. Belinsky, do you have this? Could you help me find it? Could I borrow it?" So I think that what you said, Dan, is is key. Is that you know maybe there are other places for some of these materials to go that may be better suited as institutions evolve. Um, to go back to another question, uh, Gordon says, the ship's name really stands out to me. 1893, the beginning of the progressive era, the role of the idea or myth of progress in US imagination, but then also the decline of the whaling industry. And he says, purely ironic coincidence. Um, and that is interesting. <laughs> it's, a total, it's a total coincidence. It had, had that name for decades. Uh, it had been the progress, you know, during the, the heyday of, of whaling, uh, kept that name. It actually had an original name, uh, the Charles Phelps, uh, for a few years after it was launched out of uh, Rhode Island. I think it was built in Rhode Island, but had been the progress for, for, for decades. Um, and it, it absolutely is this, this huge irony that a ship meant to embody a dying industry is called 
progress and, and, you know, all the times that, you know, this sort of disconnect between, you know, a throwback to a golden age of, of whaling and, and where modern, um, you know, Chicago was, you know, in the 1890s, you know, all sort of bubble up around this name progress, you know, what, what is the future? What is the direction? What is, where are we headed? Um, and, um, and it, I will say, I don't think I ever read an article that explicitly uh, pointed out the irony of, of its name. Um, I think even in the 1890s, people were still, you know, I mean, I think one thing that's important, one thing that, you know, going back to my ancestor that, you know, I kept thinking about is whaling wasn't gone. You know, it was dying. It was certainly a ghost of what it had been. But there was still a whaling community. There were still people going out, you know, still crews going out, still men going out every year doing whaling voyages, um, even as this museum is being conceived and, and launched. Um, and so, you know, I think even in the 1890s, people are aware of not being, um, not wanting to inscribe a tombstone too early even as you know, you're, you're creating a museum that's essentially meant to be a memorial to an industry. One, one more specific question about the progress um, from Dennis who asked about a bark. A bark is a type of ship, is that mm -hmm. correct? And yeah. were there different sized barks? He says that he has found the name of one of his ancestors who arrived from Germany on you know, the such and such bark. And he wondered if you could, could share anything of, about, about the bark as a, so, as a ship type. <laughs> yeah, so as a ship type, it has to do with the uh, masts and rigging. Um, so it has to do with you know, how the sails are gone. Um, most whale ships were barks, but not all of them were. And in fact, one of the things that was really interesting in this particular story is the Progress wasn't the original ship that was going to go to Chicago. Um, it was actually a schooner, uh, which is a different type of ship that but had been used for whaling and one of the reasons it got nixed is everyone thought it was too small no one believed that it was a whale ship um and so the bark was definitely a bigger ship um that sort of again going to the conversation patrick and i were having that you were asking me about you know fitting these sort of mental images fitting these tropes fitting these sort of pop culture references you know one of those is you know the ship needs to look the part um, and so uh, the guy, the poor, poor guy that had the schooner uh, that thought his uh, ship was going to be bought and sent to Chicago ends up on the losing end, um, you know, partly because it didn't, it didn't seem like it, it, it fit what people thought it should in their imaginations. What, one more question about the progress. Um, Emma Johansson, who I think you know, Dan, and is a great, uh, <laughs> A great intern here at the Biltzen asks about the limitations of a museum on the water and how that might have affected the progress's run and the fact that it was, in essence, a, a moving museum that was part of the spectacle, but also part of its downfall. I think definitely. And actually, there was a really astute reporter somewhere along the way at one of its stops, because uh, it made multiple stops uh, on its way to Chicago and, and cities like uh, Detroit and Buffalo and Montreal. Um, and one of those along the way said, you know, it's a real shame that they can't put it in a tent. Because once you see it, you know, f you know, once you stand on the dock and see this, you know, massive whale ship, you know, it's kind of like, okay, I've seen it. Do I really need to pay, a, pay a, you know, a quarter, you know, you know, which is about the equivalent of, you know, a full price movie ticket today. You know, do they really need to pay to, to go on board and, and do all this museum stuff? Um, and so, yeah, the idea that it was, you know, on the water, that you could walk up to it without having to pay anything, that you could sort of see its spectacle, um, you know, was definitely a detriment. I think a lot of people were very content to, to walk by and, and keep that quarter in their pocket. Um, and, and so that, that definitely stood out to me. Um, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, um, maybe it would have been better if, people could have gone out on it if it actually had been 
uh, of a museum that you could actually, you know, take an excursion on. You know, you bought a, a ticket, you know, went out and came back. You know, as it was, it was anchored in this this pond with all these bridges built around it. It, it was. It actually had to go to the fair really early because they had to build the fair around it. Um, they wouldn't have been able to get it in otherwise. So, so it's just it just kind of sits there. And so you, you also lose that magic of, well, what would it be like to sail? What would it be like uh, to go out on the water? What would it be like to, to chase whales? Um, you know, because it's just essentially, you know, sitting in, in the frog pond. Um, and, and that's what it takes away the magic as well. We've got one last question in the chat, um, and it's from Dick. And he asks, what is the psychology or the mindset of a founder of a museum like this. And I think, Dan, you should definitely talk about it a little bit, but I think, Patrick, I want to hear you talk about Ruben Durrett too, so. Okay, Patrick, you get to talk first, because Dan needs to talk. Oh, do I? <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, well, no, I, I think for, for Durrit, uh, there's a there's a really fantastic article in in Ohio Valley history from about ten years ago by Jacob Lee, uh, a Filson alum, who I, I think sort of wrote some of the defense about Durrit, um, and and the title there comes from Durrit being offered an artifact um, of dubious provenance um, that that really was a stretch for anyone to reasonably believe um, that that it was what it claimed to be, uh, and and he ultimately decides that. Um, that the, the story in the artifact, the value in the artifact comes from the story and from belief in it, not from any sort of um, historical uh, verified um, ability. You know, but he's also part of, of this, um, this moment of, of, quite pro of American progress in a very different sense than the way we think about it, of, of imperialism. And, and he's buddy-buddy with TR who, who believe that, you know, they're, they're capturing uh, the history of, of a moment that foretold their own um, as, as America will roll on to overseas empire with the war with Spain in a few years, um, that, that this, this push over the mountains was the embodiment of the American spirit and that they were doing everything they could to capture um, that as they understood it and preserve it at a moment where they recognize that the world is changing and that um, could be lost. And so in that fear of, of losing, you know, what they believe to be the driving sort of um, soul of America, um, they were willing to, to fudge the details maybe a little bit to, to tell a better story and have a more uh, greater impact um, on the future. And, you know, while, while we can disagree with their, certainly with their curatorial methods, um, but, but also with their interpretation, I think that recognition of the value of the past to inspiring the present and the future and, and keeping uh, the past in mind as we shape the world we want to see in the world is something that's pretty valuable and we can hang on to that piece at least. Yeah. Um, as for the progress, you know, I, I, I think it depends on who you view as as the founder, you know, for the folks in New Bedford that, that came up with this idea that, that had the whale ship to sell, um, you know, for them, it very much was a, an educational, uh, I found the phrase used over and over again, worthy representation of the industry. You know, they really wanted people to understand their, the whaling industry, understand, you know, what it was, what, how it worked, um, you know, really become educated in this. You know, for the guy that actually bought it, I think it was about money. You know, he wanted a popular attraction at the fair that would would, you know, earn back uh, the money that he sunk into it. That that didn't happen. Um, what so what was so interesting in my research is the one person who really bridged those two um, very competing, very different viewpoints was my own ancestor, uh, Bloody Dan. Um, actually came back from Chicago uh, after he dropped off the, the whale ship, sort of turned it over, came back to New Bedford and gave an interview and basically said, it's terrible. Um, it has nothing to do with whaling. Um, it's, they're doing a terrible job. Uh, they've put electric lights on it. Uh, all they're doing is selling seashells. And worst of all, they have women on board. 
Um, so, so, you know, but I think in that, that sort of interview, he, he definitely sort of encapsulates this idea of what are the founders of tenants, you know, and, and for someone like him, someone, you know, that had been a whale, whaleman, you know, from 16 years old, um, that was a very different answer from what was actually being created in Chicago uh, once the ship, ship was there. I think that's a really sort of interesting place to probably draw the line tonight. It's just about seven o'clock. Um, so founders intent, pop culture expectations, um, adventure interpretation. I think I can speak, you know, as a member of the collections team and, and Patrick could as well, that these are things we really are still grappling with today when we look at both acquiring collections, describing collections, and then presenting them to the public, whether it's in a digital format or, you know, ideally one day again in person with everyone um, post-pandemic. So, um, Patrick, Dan, if you all don't have any, have, or if you all have any closing thoughts, please feel free to, to jump in now. And if not, we'll uh, thank everyone for attending tonight. And I really appreciated this discussion. It's great to hear about the similarities, I think, in just, you know, museums, even floating ones. Um, <laughs> and what we, where we, where we thought, you know, Patrick and I are, are working today. There's, thank you so thank much you. for having me. Yeah, and, and thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much to Dan for, for really being open to this conversation um, and, and helping us get the word out. Um, I think this has been a really valuable conversation for us at the Filson to, to have um, and to share with our audiences tonight. I think these are really important questions that we wrestle with, again, as Jenny was saying, as professionals, but to, to bring this sort of outside of the office or outside of a different Zoom call as it is now. Um, and, and to have these in public, I think is really important. So thanks for the opportunity. Great, thank you. Have a good night, everybody.